Hello and welcome to 2021. In fact, I've titled my message this morning, Goodbye 2020. Hello 2021. This is the 3rd of January of a brand new year, and uh, it's kind of exciting and filled with hope and anticipation, at least for many of us, because 2020 has not been such a good year in many ways. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to take a little while to get to my text I'll start off in Revelation chapter 1, uh, but it, it's going to take me a while before I actually start to share some of the scripture with you, although I will go ahead and read uh, the text verse, which is Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 8. The Lord Jesus is speaking to the Apostle John, who is on the Isle of Patmos, and as he speaks, Jesus says this, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Lord, please bless this message, the preaching and teaching of your word today. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. amen. Most of you have seen the classic movie from, I think it was 1946, called It's a Wonderful Life. Jimmy Stewart played the part of George Bailey, a small-town banker, who seemed to be driven to the brink of suicide because of the financial ruin and disasters and disgrace that he was set up for. Even though he wanted to help the people of the town, the, the evil other banker, the competitor, uh, were, was trying to arrange things to make George look bad and look like a failure. And so he's convinced that his life has not only been a failure, but he convinced himself that it would have been better if he had never been born at all. As he looks back on his past, all he can see are broken dreams and thwarted ambitions. That's kind of a sad life. But yet that's true of so many today. Beloved, without the Lord Jesus Christ, we would be a failure. Amen? Amen. A failure destined for eternal damnation. The good news is that the love of God has been extended to a fallen race, the human race, and the Lord offers us salvation through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen to that. So in that movie, in response to George's prayer and the prayer of others, George's fictional guardian angel, Clarence, is sent to help him. In order to show how George is wrong about his assessment of his own life, Clarence pulls back the curtain and reveals how different things would have been if George had never been born. In doing so, he shows George what a positive impact his life has had on others. Well, folks, as we begin 2021, let us purpose to impact others with the truth of God's Word. Let us be a witness. Let us be salt and light to point the world to the Savior. If you make any kind of New Year's resolution, and I mentioned to you before, I don't. I don't do that anymore. But if you do, at least resolve that you're going to draw closer to the Lord and let His light shine through your life. Because most assuredly, Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. Amen. But first, there are a few things about 2020 that I want to share with you. The year 2020 was a very unusual year. The thing that really knocked us flat on our back was a Chinese flu virus that had hit us early on in that year. In fact, we really didn't know what it was or what it was called, but there was something serious spreading that was unleashed upon this world, either by accident or on purpose, I don't know. But I do know the results has totally changed our lives. And I don't know that we're ever going to go back to what previously we considered normal. Because of the fear generated by the news media, people are afraid to live their lives as they did in the past. 
It is true that this virus spreads quickly, just like a flu virus does. Our lives have changed never to be the same. And I don't want to omit saying a special thank you to all who work in the healthcare uh, and um, frontline facilities who care for the sick and dying, these medical personnel who risk their lives daily to care for those who are sick and afflicted. Hospitals are strained to the limit to provide beds and care for those who are infected. But we also know that hospitals have been given an economic impact or incentive to inflate the number of deaths that they attribute to COVID-19. For the last few months, our news media here for our local news always starts off the news program and for about 15 or 20 minutes gives us, gives us all the facts and figures and numbers about the COVID virus cases that uh, people have tested positive and, and the number uh, um, in each county and, and the number of deaths per county and, and for the state. What I've done for the last several months is while looking at the local news, I take out my calculator and when they announce how many COVID deaths there are, the total number of COVID deaths, I take that and divide that by the total number of positive cases they're reporting. I multiply my answer times 100 to change it to percent. And Mississippi has almost consistently run around 2.5%. That means that out of the number of cases they report since March and the number of deaths they have reported since March, we're running at about 2.5%. That means that about 2.5 people per every 100 people are dying for, uh, because of this COVID uh, disease. I myself tested positive for COVID back in Jan June, and uh, I survived. I'm here. Aren't you glad? I'm glad that I'm here. I survived it, thanks to the Lord, and thanks to the prayers of many of God's people, including you folks. Um, I went in a little while later for a follow-up test because my wife and my uh, family were told to go back to work. They had to have a negative test following about with COVID. And the doctor very plainly told us that they do not advise getting a follow-up test. The Mississippi Department of Health does not advise it. The CDC does not advise it. And our doctor explained that it's because many people will test positive for COVID even after they're already over it. And they may test positive for months after they've had it. Because the tests that they run amplify or magnify that search for the virus so that even if they find a little piece or a little fragment of that virus, it will count it as testing positive. That is a false positive. That's not true and it's not accurate. The CDC has admitted that the number of COVID deaths in the USA of the number that they report related to COVID only about 6% of those deaths are actually caused by the COVID flu virus. The other 94% have tested positive for COVID, but there were other extenuating cir circumstances that caused a person's death. Whether it was pneumonia, uh, whether it was something like COPD, or whether it was a car accident, heart attack, or stroke, or cancer. Recent CDC data shows this interesting information about the rate of survival for this corona flu virus, this Chinese virus. For people ages zero to the age of 19, they have a 99.997% of recovery from coming down with COVID. That means that only three thousandths of 1% of people from ages zero to 19 do not recover from COVID. For ages 20 through 49, they have a 99.98% chance of recovery. For people ages 50 through 69, and I would fit in that category, a 99.5% recovery rate. And for those who are over the set, who, those who are 70 and over, their rate of survival is 94.6%. The vaccine that they're working on 
does not even guarantee that it will keep us from getting that COVID virus. And now we have reports of a mutated version of that virus that was in Europe but is now in this country, and the vaccine's not really designed to work with that form of the virus. Vaccine development usually takes about 10 years from the time of identifying the virus and beginning to research work on a potential vaccine to going through the testing phase, going through trials on animals and human trials till the point where it's approved for uh, distrib distribution to the general populace is about 10 years. And yet we've had a vaccine that is now being administered that's only been researched for several months. What are the long-term effects of this vaccine? We don't know. Will this vaccine help more than it hurts? We really don't know. I want to give you a little bit of the science behind this. God has designed our bodies fantastically. In each cell of our body, we have a double helix, sort of a swirly type of molecules called DNA, deoxyribonucleic uh, deoxy, uh, acid. And this DNA is basically the blueprint for you and for me. Our body uses a smaller set of molecules called mRNA, messenger RNA, which copies part of that blueprint and gives it over to the transfer RNA, the tRNA, to tell our body to begin to build these additional DNA um, based cells that our body is made up of. The older vaccines that they used to give out generally had either some deactivated virus or attenuated virus, a weakened form of it, to stimulate our body to produce antibodies to fight off the virus. But something has changed. Now they're researching and offering a new type of vaccine that is based on that mRNA, messenger RNA. It's designed to enter into every cell of our body and take over part of the mechanism to get our body to produce something that would fight off this COVID. The problem is that what they're offering as a vaccine cannot easily get into our body cells. It's not soluble in that fashion. So to get it into our body cells, they use an agent called luciferin. Luciferin, when it combines with ATP, adenosine triphosphate, one of the chemical mechanisms of our body, will produce an enzyme that they call luciferase, which when combines with oxygen actually glows. It produces some light. Some of you... These names may not mean much to you, but if you're a student of the Bible, you know that Lucifer was the name of the devil. He was originally created a worshiping angel. He headed up the worship of God in heaven until he was filled with pride and rebelled against God and led a third of the angels in revolt against God. God is the light. Jesus is the light of the world, the light of this universe. God is light. Lucifer wanted to be that light, and he tried to take God off of the throne and take God's place. He was to be the light-bearing angel. He was to bear the light of God, and instead he wanted to steal the light for himself. I think it's rather problematic, at least in my mind, to know that part of what they're using in this new vaccine has a form of Lucifer's name in it. Luciferin to produce luciferase. That's the, the means by which they get this mRNA vaccine into your body cells. Now, I want to hasten to tell you I'm not a medical doctor. I have an undergraduate degree in chemistry. I've taught chemistry for 25 years, so science is a very important portion of my study. And I'm not here to give anyone any medical advice. I'm only going to share with you a decision that I've made for myself personally. And that decision is, I will not be taking a COVID vaccine.
I'm concerned about something that, well, let me hasten to tell you this. This COVID vaccine is not the mark of the beast. I think it may be a precursor to it, but it's not the mark of the beast. But I'm leery of taking anything that will mess with my genetic makeup that God has placed within my body. That's where I'm coming from. Now, my decision is kind of like what Paul uh, was talking about in 1 Corinthians when he wrote to the Corinthian believers about eating meat that was offered to idols. Some Christians would go ahead and buy that meat. And by the way, the meat that some people would offer to the idols that they worship was still good meat. And it would be sold at the marketplace for a reduced price. Many poor families couldn't afford to buy the more expensive types of meat. But they would sometimes buy this meat at that reduced price. And so some Christians would approach it like this saying, I know the idol's not real. I know that God has created everything and that God has created that meat. So even if it was offered to idols, I don't see any problem eating it. Other Christians in that day had a problem with that, saying to others, you shouldn't be eating that meat because it was offered as a sacrifice to that idol. We don't care whether it's, it's a false god or not, it still was offered to an idol and therefore Christians should not eat of it. Paul explained that with this dilemma, people had to make up their own minds. He said, we shouldn't judge one another in the eating of meats, but rather it should be an individual God-directed decision. And once God's led you to make a decision, just live by it. So I'm just sharing my decision with you. For those who by way of video are here present, who decide to take the vaccine, I fully support you. I'm not going to judge you, and I ask that you don't judge me in that decision. Whether someone is for it or against it, there are some important truths that we need to follow as we make decisions like this. And I'll share a couple of those scriptural um, uh, important items with you in just a moment. So this vaccine is offered as possibly uh, something that might prevent someone from, from getting covid but it's not 100% guaranteed. But it also may lessen the effects of COVID on a person. And I know that we do have many people in our church who are older, who, if they were to come down with this virus, may not survive. And that would be a tragic thing. I would not wish that on anyone. The Lord brought me through it. I don't know if he'd bring you through it. I don't know that I still have antibodies in my system, but my body did learn to fight that COVID virus. But your body may not have learned that. And maybe this is the answer that you need. As I shared with those statistics, we know that those that are over the age of 70 are much more susceptible to this disease, especially those who are confined in nursing homes or, or confined in hospitals. So that's kind of the bad news. I'm just sort of reflecting on what 2020 has brought us. There are many other things that we ought to be concerned about. This coming week, Congress will be in session and we'll consider the report of the Electoral College. I think there's been election fraud. I think there's a lot of proof of election fraud. And I'm thankful that we have some congressmen and at least one senator, senator who's going to rise in objection to that report and saying we need to take a closer look at it. Because I believe President Trump was reelected in a landslide on November 3rd. And I think the truth is the truth. And it's time for whatever treachery was done by many of the people in this country that the curtain needs to be pulled back so that people can see what that is. I'm not going to talk about that, though, this morning. That's all I want to say. But there's a lot for you and I to pray about. There's a lot of dangerous things happening. Why is all this coming upon us? And, and it's coming so suddenly. It's because the Bible teaches us that we are living in the last days and that, that these things are coming that are pushing forward a one-world government system. 
and the United States of America, you and I who are patriots, you and I who believe in our religious freedom to worship God here in church according to the teaching of the Bible, you and I who believe that we still have the right to free freedom of speech and freedom of the press, that we have the right to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances, we have the right to keep and bear arms, and I'm just into the Second Amendment by the time I'm getting to that point, that we stand in the way of these one-worlders. And they're doing everything they can to destroy our way of life and destroy our God-given rights to build the kingdom of Antichrist. But there are some precious truths that I need to share with you because it's not all doom and gloom. There is some good news. I preached several messages here recently about the Christmas story. And the Christmas story is a story of good news. The shepherds heard the angels say, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That's good news. They were bringing good tidings of great joy. And those tidings have never changed. There's still great joy in the gospel message. I shared a verse with you at the beginning of this message, and it's time for me to get back into the scripture. Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 8. And the first thing I would suggest to you this morning is that Jesus Christ is the beginning and the ending. While the world seems to be falling apart and the devil's hard at work to build this kingdom for his ally Christ, I want to tell you that Jesus Christ is still on the throne. Jesus Christ is the beginning and ending. Revelation 1.8, Jesus said, I am. And before I go further, let me explain to you those two words, I am, in the Greek language is just one word, a me, is, is the Greek equivalent for it. This is the same way God revealed himself to Moses there at the burning bush. When Moses said, who shall I tell them sent me, God says, tell them I am. Moses was afraid they wouldn't believe him, so he, he needed some other authority. He needed to tell them about God, and God says, tell them that I am. Praise God, he still is. Amen? Amen. He is the great I am. That's the good news. Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter. It's like A through Z in our alphabet. And then he said, the beginning and the ending. Folks, before this earth was created, before that solar, solar system was put in place, before the stars were sprinkled all around us, God is the I Am. Jesus Christ was in the beginning. John 1.1 1, 1 says, the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Not only is He the beginning, but Jesus Christ is the ending. From eternity past to eternity future, He is God. And we must never forget that. Jesus Christ is the beginning and the ending. And I've used up a lot of my time already. I need to move on quickly. The second point that I would make today is in Revelation 12, starting with verse number 7. If you care to turn there to Revelation, the 12th chapter, starting with verse number 7. My second point is that Lucifer, Satan, the devil, hates God and hates all of his children. Revelation 12, starting with the seventh verse, and there was war in heaven. Folks, you and I don't realize the amount of warfare that goes on in this universe. Paul said that we don't wrestle or fight against, prince, uh, against flesh and blood. Our war that we're a part of is through principalities and powers and, and those in positions of great evil and powers of darkness that be. It says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels, Michael is on the Lord's side in case you didn't know. He's a good angel. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels. The dragon is the devil, Satan. And he fought with his angels against God's angels and, and Michael who was leading them. Verse 8, So the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, 
neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. The Bible isn't specific to tell us when this conflict takes place. But what we do know is that the devil and those angels with him were cast down. It could have happened many, many thousands of years ago or even near the beginning. I do know that in Luke 10, 18, Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Jesus said we kicked Satan out and he fell as lightning. So we know that Lucifer, the devil, hates God and hates all of God's children. In, then, uh, in verses 12, uh, excuse me, chapter 12, verses 10 through 12, brings me to my third point, and that is the devil accuses us to God's face. The devil likes nothing more than to get in the face of God and point his evil, wicked, fiery finger against you and me as God's children. <clears throat> Verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. That's the good news, right? Now has come salvation. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. We read in the book of Job how Satan, the devil, appeared before God. He did twice, in fact. You just start reading there in, in the first couple chapters of Job, and you'll see right away. And the devil accused God and accused Job. God says, have you considered my servant Job? He's upright. A man who eschews evil. And the devil said, the only reason he loves you and serves you is because of all the stuff you give him. If you'd take away the stuff you gave him, he wouldn't love you and serve you anymore. And God says, all right, I'll let you take away the stuff. Just don't take his life. And the devil did. All in one day. And yet, Job didn't sin. Job wondered why God allowed it to happen, but he still loved God and served God. The devil even afflicted him with those sores, with those boils from head to toe. And in all this, the Bible says Job sinned not. Job was a man of righteousness and faith. Satan is the accuser. It says, which accused them before our God day and night. Verse 11, and they, who's they? It's the brethren, the children of God. And they, that includes us, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. It's talking about people who are even martyred for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having, a great, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. We're going to see the devil more and more active in these last days. More and more evil will be upon us. More Christian persecution. There are still cities and states where people are told not to worship in church or that they can only have greatly reduced numbers, where people are told you can't sing in church, you might spread the virus, where they're, they locked up pastors. And we had some of that going on earlier this summer here in Mississippi, within about 100 miles of us, writing citations for church members who sat in the parking lot in their vehicles with their windows closed for a worship service. And officials were telling them, you can't do that. But these Christians like Peter and John in Acts chapter 5 said, should we obey God or obey man? The disciples, they made the choice to obey God. We will obey God rather than man. When man's laws and rules conflict with God's true word, we must stay true to the word of God. 
So I told you that first of all, Jesus Christ is the beginning and the ending. Lucifer the devil hates God and hates God's children. And the devil accuses us to God's face. But lastly, I want to encourage you with this. Christ Jesus will return to take us to heaven. He will, without a shadow of a doubt. He promised over and over and over again that he will come back someday. And God never, ever has broken a promise. And he never, ever will break a promise. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Verses 16 and 17 give us a very familiar passage, one that I've preached out of many times before. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Think about that for a minute. As I meditated on that scripture in, in preparations for the message, you know, it, it come to my heart again that it's going to be the Lord Jesus himself. He doesn't send a surrogate. He's not sending some angels to come and get believers out of this world. He's not sending one of the Old Testament saints like Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. He's not sending any of the apostles to come and get us and take us to, to Christ who's up there in heaven. No, it says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Jesus is coming for you and for me. He's not sending someone else. He's coming, he himself. Job had faith in the resurrection because in Job 19, I believe it's verse 25, Job was talking about on that day of resurrection, I know that my Redeemer liveth and shall stand on the earth. And Job acknowledged the fact that worms would destroy his body. But Job said, yet in my flesh, I shall see God whom I shall see for myself and not another. Job said, I know I will see him on that resurrection day. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. And when he descends, there's going to be a shout. It's going to be loud enough to get the attention even of those who are dead in the grave. The righteous dead. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, there's going to be a lot of noise and attention drawn at the coming of Christ. And the dead shall rise, dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're starting a brand new year of 2021. And the good news is Jesus is coming soon. You know what? It could be this year. He could even come today. I don't know when he's coming, but I know he's coming soon. And I know the Bible teaches us as believers to watch and pray under the coming of the Lord. The very last promise that we read in the Bible in Revelation 22 is where Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. And the prayer response from the, the Apostle John there in Patmos was, Even so, come Lord Jesus. John said, Amen. Come on, Lord. We're ready for you. John was ready for him nearly 2,000 years ago. Well, I'm ready for him today. And I believe you are too. Amen? Amen. How wonderful if 2021 is the year when Jesus Christ comes again. There was a man who told this story. He said, When my son was four years old, he was sitting in the bedroom and we could hear his frustrated voice all the way in the living room. The vocal frustration grew and grew until finally his mother went to check and see what the problem was. She walked into his bedroom and saw the boy sitting before a pile of blocks on the floor. She watched as he very carefully began to stack the blocks meticulously one on top of the other to make a tower. The pile grew and began to take shape, although the blocks began to lean just a little bit because it was placed on the carpet. When the boy got to the last layer, put that block on, everything went tumbling down. And again, he uttered his sound of frustration. So Mama went over and explained how the carpet was the problem. It was uneven and that 
It would move depending on the weight of the blocks that were on it. She explained to him he had to have a solid foundation. So she went over to the books that were there in his bedroom and picked out a large book from his collection and brought it over and put it down on the floor. And she told him this time to begin building by putting his blocks on the book. As he began to stack up the blocks again, he got very excited. The blocks, to his amazement, stayed in place. And from then on, he would leave them standing in his room, sometimes for weeks on end, just to prove to himself that the blocks did not tumble and fall. They stayed up because they were on a solid foundation. As we begin this new year of 2021, we too need to start on a solid foundation. Before you pick up the phone and start to ask advice of friends and neighbors and relatives and, and try to find out what they might tell you to do in a situation, what I would like to tell you is the first thing to do is to talk to God. Get with God so that you start with the solid foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to have a solid foundation. Seek out his word for advice and for guidance in your life. His word will give you the stability that you need. Just as a mama told her boy to build on the book, I'm telling you today in no uncertain terms, build your life on the book. This is God's book, the storybook of redemption. In this book, God covers all the possible details of our life, all possible situations that you and I are faced with, and God tells us the difference between right and wrong. Christ Jesus died so that you and I might live, not just in 2021, but to live with him forever and ever. Amen. Build your life on the book, God's book, the Bible. Jesus died so that we don't have to. And then he rose from the grave to show us that we too can be part of that great resurrection at the time of the end, that resurrection unto eternal life. Amen. We're going into a new year. Do we know what this year holds? <coughs> no. Things happen so quickly in 2020. It might even be faster. There might be massive changes in 2021. But the Lord Jesus, he does not change. And his book doesn't change. Build on the book. Stay true to the Lord. And you'll make it until he's ready to call you home or when he comes at the rapture. I'm going to ask our musicians to please come. And let's stand as we have a word of prayer together. <coughs> Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died so that we don't have to. That you rose again to guarantee our resurrection. That you promised without a doubt you would come again. And Lord, while I look around this world and I see the kingdom of evil, the kingdom of Antichrist building all around us, Lord, I know that you're building your kingdom within our lives. You're building your church and you promised us that the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. You said that the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. It says that in the scripture. And you teach in the scripture that the church is your bride. And one day you're coming to collect your bride for the greatest wedding this universe will ever see. Lord, I just am so glad to be a small part of that. Lord, I know I will be in that number when those saints go marching in. I'm looking upward day by day, just wondering, could this be the day when you come again? Lord, it's one thing for those of us as Christians to be ready to go. But around us, there are a lot of people who are not truly serving you and living for you. There are a lot of people who won't go at the time of the rapture. And many will be left behind and will be faced with that decision one day to take that mark of the beast without which nobody can buy or sell. 
It teaches us in the Bible, Lord, if people would refuse the mark in that day, they might lose their life. But it's far better to lose the physical life and gain eternal life. Lord, whatever decisions we make, help them to be based on your word and on your principles and the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Be with our church as we continue on having service week by week. Lord, we know this uh, disease is, is deadly and, and it uh, spreads so quickly. Our hearts go out to those who are suffering from it. Uh, even some of my close preacher friends and, and people that we know and people who come here to church uh, even for a time. We know that they've been affected by the disease and, and uh, one even has passed away uh, at an advanced age uh, related to COVID and, and pray for the White family uh, as Sister Laura and Brother Freddie continue to grieve over the passing of their father. But Lord, most of all, help us to grieve over our sinful life and make sure that we repent, that we get right with you and that we share the gospel message with the lost so that they too can walk in the light as you are in the light. And one of these days we can just walk off or fly off of this world into the light of your eternal kingdom. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.